People of God, y'all doing all right? <clears throat> Good. I just left service, so my throat, my voice is not that great. <clears throat> I'm probably going hoarse because I was at my brother Rodney, Elder Rodney, Dr. Rodney Jones's pastoral anniversary, five years. Congratulate him. Um, I'm going to talk about these marketplace preachers. I saw a, uh, a meme here that says, stop attending churches where you are spiritually dying for the sake of staying at a church you grew up in. Y'all understand that? I think a lot of us had that problem. I know I did. Stop attending a church where you are spiritually dying for the sake of staying at a church where you grew up in. Um, I got too attached to the people that was there and I got too attached to the, to the uh, pastor that was there, which caused me to start my process downward spiral of dying because I was not attached to the word of God because I wasn't really getting the word of God. I was getting bullying. Somebody asked the question. I'll, I'll, I guess I'll ask it at the end of the show, but I want to talk about uh, these marketplace uh, uh, pastors and preachers to find out where they come from and why are they the way they are and why are we even calling them marketplace? Y'all know why. 1060. You're good. You're good. You're good. You're good. Don't stop it. Base. It's the show that will get you thinking and where the topics are hot. Feel free to comment whether we agree or not. Cause he days a week, always on time, but this time is not free, so Walter Jones, always on sleep, latest trending topics, had you jumping out your seat, he's got something to say, come on in, the water's fine. Hey everybody, so water, so water, Jones show. I'm he. It is the evening or weekend edition, baby. <laughs> Hi, it's coming in. Watch fine, watch fine. I'll get my voice back tomorrow or Tuesday. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Uh, listen, marketplace preachers. These are men. I'm gonna talk about men because you know women pastors is very questionable here on the show. I mean, we we talked about it. We don't see where you know if you are a woman pastor. I I I don't want to offend you. I see. Ooh, I see a. Large, gigantic spider on my wall. It's about that big. It looks like a tarantula. Hold on, I gotta take a picture of this. I gotta take a picture of this. The thing is huge. Hold on, hold on, y'all, hold on. It is the biggest thing. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Oh, okay, hold on. Right there. All right. I know I'm doing this live, but that thing is so big, y'all. It's big. I need to take a video of this. I've never done this before. Live. Live, y'all. It's live. This is live. This is live. A tarantula has invaded the Sir Walter Jones office. That thing is big. I'm scared. Uh-oh. Where'd it go? Here it is. Okay, I'm going to show y'all that. I'm going to show you this spider. Uh, is that arach arachnophobia? Hmm. Hmm. Is that what that is? That thing right there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Let me find the picture. Let me see if I can find it on my screen here so I can show y'all. That thing is huge. Come through, come through. Did it come through? All right. I know y'all like, is he really doing this? Is he doing this live? Is he really doing this? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm doing this live. Oh, okay, hold on, hold on. I have to do something. I have to do something right here. Hold on. I just want y'all to see the spider. It was so warm today. Um, that uh, I guess the the spiders come out at night. I, I, I'm too far, so the, it doesn't it doesn't really show like I wanted to show. Okay, uh, but it's it, it, look at that. <laughs> Did y'all see that? Hmm? Did y'all see it? It look maybe it looks small on the on the camera, but that sucker was big. Him big. I'm gonna have to move out. Look at that. <laughs> Harvey said, jump ship. 
<laughs> that thing is huge. Shoot. All right. All right, where was I? Uh, marketplace. Marketplace. <laughs> Just get up and kill it. Somebody said. <laughs> Somebody said, I'm concerned. Just get up and kill it. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's talk about the marketplace, shall we? Hold on, let me let me let me play this on the video. I, I just want y'all to see what what I could possibly be scared of. <laughs> oh man, it ain't showing. It ain't showing no more. All right, let's get back. Let's let's go back to YouTube. All right, there's a lot of people who are out here uh, being inundated with preaching and teaching that is erroneous. It makes no sense. Okay. Um, when you are college degreed, I'm talking PhD and they're calling you doctor and you still teaching the doctrine of paying a tithe. And if you don't pay it, you, uh, you are, you will be cursed. We got a bigger problem in our church than I thought we did. You are a doctor. Uh, here's the thing. The, um, seminary don't, don't teach you really uh, stuff that might be might seem mediocre, uh, mediocrity, or some some things that you you like. Oh, how was it that he got that understanding? But he's a doctor. It's because uh, Bible college teaches you how to understand a system to understand the Bible. It's called in inductive study. So they don't go in the Bible and say, okay, this is what this scripture means. No. They teach you how to examine things, how to process things, and how to put the puzzles together. And over eight weeks' time, you have created something beautiful, all right? You go and you do something with that. So it is no surprise that somebody who is called a doctor will still be preaching that you are going to be cursed with the curse if you are not paying the tithe. You understand? And I look at those men and I say, God help us all. My focus is doing today's show is to talk against these men who are company men. You got some pastors out there who are company men. They shop at the company store. Whatever their denomination is, they are going to adhere to all of the principles, which they should be because they don't under denomination. But even if that, those principles are erroneous, isogetical, uh, messologies, they will uh, run with it because they want to be accepted in that denomination or within that club. Whether it's whether it's a apostolic, whether it's a church of God in Christ, whether it's a, a Baptist sect, or whether it's a full gospel, whether it's Seventh Day Adventist, I don't care who it is. You want to? Uh, it's like somebody going um, and get, getting hired, and they stay on the job a long time because they want to climb the ladder. There are many men of God who want to climb the corporate ladder of that denomination. You understand? Uh, and so they stay there, and then they become superintendents. Uh, they become uh, bishops. They become all these other things. Uh, and um, many of them only became that because they, they said yes. They are company men. And they shop at the company store. They are marketplace preachers. And you know them a dime a dozen. And the world loves them too. Because they'll have this guy to come and give an inspirational talk on some type of radio show, TV show, newscast, or civic settings or what have you. They feel safe bringing this marketplace preacher in because he's not going to, first of all, invoke Jesus' name. He's going to use kind uh, uh, lukewarm words uh, like uh, our, our, our hearts and thoughts are with you. <laughs> yeah. And he will not sign off his prayer, you know, by saying in Jesus name, he won't. And so they feel safe bringing in the TD Jakes to talk about stuff because Jakes is, is not going to uh, invoke the name in, a, in, a, uh, in the name that we know it. The name may slip, slip up in his, in his mouth, but He's going to, like uh, Kelly says, give candy. And how much is that uh, that doggy in the window? The candy man. So I'm looking at this. Um, I'm looking at the history of uh, those in the Bible. Thank you, Michelle, polit politically correct. I'm looking at the history of those men in the Bible who were 
was so intellectually sound. They they had no fear. They were very bold, and they could meet and and be a part of all kind of a, a civic settings, and they didn't fear anyone. I mean, look at Moses. We all talk about how Moses stutters. Okay, listen. I don't think he stuttered. I think this is a tale passed down over time. And we say he stuttered because of the things he was saying to God that he couldn't talk. I don't think that's the case because we see and we see in the new what they even talk about. Moses was excellence of speech and he knew all of the mysteries of the Egyptians. I don't think he stuttered. <clears throat> now y'all gonna go against me and say, well, people who are stutters are excellent in speech. Okay. Right. Yeah. True, true, true that. <clears throat> I don't think he stuttered. He was brilliant. He knew the Egyptian language and he knew that the culture and he knew science and mathematics and what have you. And God used him because of the knowledge that he had. All right. He became someone, as you know, Jesus even brought him up, said that that guy, man, Moses. Mm. Um, and then let's look at Joseph. Joseph was in the same situation. He went over there. He was sold into slavery. Now he's second in command in Egypt. And he knew he was an Egyptologist. <laughs> Uh, he knew all of the mysteries and he knew how to will and deal. He knew business and he saved his whole family and saved all of Egypt. And those other, t the whole world had to come to Egypt to get grain. The whole world at that time, the whole world was kind of small, but Joseph was a preacher. Daniel, the same way he knew the mysteries. He, he was in Babylon and he was, he was captive with these other men and uh, he was able to, a wheel and deal and, and tell dreams and, and God used him mightily. He was a preacher. The apostle Paul who had dual citizenship, he, uh, he was, he was an expert in the law. He was a Pharisee, uh, but he knew how to talk to a Gentile. Like he knew how to talk to a Hebrew, like he knew how to talk to a Greek and he knew how to talk to a Roman. He was excellent. And what he knew the science all right. He even said, I, I, I'm, I can talk to you all. He says, I'm, I'm not going to talk to these people here who are milk drinkers uh, because um, you may not understand what I'm saying. But I, but when I'm in a room with these philosophers, he says, I have excellency of speech, too. I know how to talk to these these uh, theologians. I know how to talk to these men who are uh, doctors of, of philosophy. He, he was good at that. But he also knew how to talk to somebody who didn't even who dropped out of high school. Do you understand? Today we have marketplace preachers who can't even talk to somebody on the street, a drunk, who, who know more than them because they're too coddled up and caught up into the, the fanfares uh, of the colloquial speakings that we do in our church. Hello, walls. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, fake tongues <clears throat> and fake theologies and weak theologies at that don't know how to really properly interpret the scriptures. And they can't even tell you why Jesus died for our sins. If you ask them, why did he die? I'm telling you, they can't go back no further. If you doubt, if you, they don't, because they don't know the, the customs and the manners of the Jewish people. So because they don't have that history, they can only tell you a little bit about why Jesus died, but they can't tell you the beginning the whole purpose of why he did it. And it can't even tell you why that salvation came to the Jew first. In order to understand that concept, you got to understand the customs and manners of the Jews. You understand both natural and, and spiritual. And then you would understand why Jesus was saying some things that he was saying to the disciples. But to us, when we read it, it seems ridiculous. I go to prepare a place for you. If it wasn't so, I would have told you in my father's house of many mansions, what? Where? Where's your father's house? Where is that? Is that in heaven? Where's your father's house? <clears throat> okay. Uh, even when he um, was at the wedding and, the, and uh, it, uh, he turned the water to wine on a certain day. It was the third day. That's significant right there. Even when he came out of the tomb and there was, there was the, the covering, the shawl, the, the, the napkin was sitting there and it was nicely folded. And he wasn't there. That has significance, too, with the Jewish people, with us. Uh, as we understood, as we borrowed their customs, because when you fold the napkin, it tells the waiter who's coming that I'll be back. Don't take my plate. <laughs> I learned that in etiquette when I um, one of one of the bunkers 
um, had an etiquette school uh, that she had uh, started, and she I went to her office and she had it all spread out, and she taught me proper etiquette. And then I remember I have a book called a book by Emily Post that I was reading in the nineteen early nineteen eighties. That book is about that thick. Emily Post on how to you know attend weddings and how to sit and have the table, sit at the table, and which fork to use, which when the soup comes, you know, which side to put the, which, which how, how to sip your, you know, your, your soup in, in the, what do you call it? The salsa, <laughs> all kind of things, you know, how to hold it. We even had obedience. Uh, was it, what was it called? It wasn't obedience school, but it was, um, it, it was like an etiquette thing where when when I, I remember being in grammar school and they we put they put books on our head and we had to walk uh, because they were trying to show us a posture proper posture what have you they told us how to they showed us how to be um, shivers towards the girls you know when a woman walks in you know you stand or when a woman uh, when she was getting ready to sit down you know you pull the, the chair <clears throat> and then you push her chair in and all these things. I learned that in grammar school. Charm school, thank you. Charm school. These are the things that I, I was taught. All that died, went away. So these men are not learning any of that stuff. They had an Easter speech, and now they are bishops and pastors and apostles and prophets. So here I'm going to play body. Um, this is this this is not my stuff, so I might get it might get snatched, or I, I don't really care. <laughs> I just want y'all to learn something here. Your body may not be a, a, a someone that you may care for, but here I thought it was great the way he answered the CNN lady. This is Mike Joyful Exile uh, YouTube channel. He's got about two hundred seventeen thousand subscribers, so it's a big channel. But the name of this is called CNN Labs at Pastor. And he immediately regrets it. I want y'all to listen to this because I think this is going to, I think all pastors who might be struggling in their knowledge, those who are honest will tell you that they are. Watching how body handles these CNN, uh, these news people will help men who are struggling on how can they talk to people of the world. See, it's easy for these um marketplace preachers to talk to people in their denomination. They can go to another pastor's anniversary and talk in the mic and those people get all excited because they're in the company. But it's harder for these same men who are miracle workers and slaying people on the anointing, all that stuff. They can't even talk to a regular person. They can't talk to a politician. They can't talk to a professor. They can't, they can't talk. They, they just can't talk to a newscaster uh, because they are, they use they use these country style banter they've been doing it all their lives they don't even know how to talk regular English <laughs> all right all right and so um, let's see and I knew at that moment that I would never be back on that person's show again. And I mean, he's just doing everything that he can and he's not getting what he wants. And so at the end, he's like, you know, we just got a, a, a few more seconds left. And, and he says, well, I, I just, I just want to ask you, because he's gone every angle that he could go, right, to try to get whatever it is that he's trying to get and prove that I'm the wrong kind of black man, I guess. There's a reason why pastors with solid biblical theology are rarely interviewed by the mainstream media. When Vody Bauckham was interviewed by CNN, Bauckham communicated the extremely unpopular biblical truth that God created males and females to have different roles within certain contexts. And, and here's what's interesting, Reverend Bauckham, she's winning over church members, uh, church leaders that don't even allow women uh, to preach at the pulpit, yet she could be leading the country. What do you make of that? Well, it's interesting. The bottom line on that is people look at this ticket and their fear is that we will have Barack Obama as our president, that we will be moved toward a socialist agenda, that we would have the most radically pro-abortion candidate ever to run for president to serve in that office. And that is an untenable position for evangelicals. And so they look at this and they're trying to decide this based on what's best for the nation in the here and now. And 
oftentimes overlooking some of those other issues. Do, do you think that that's something that, are you saying that should be, that shouldn't be overlooked? I mean, do you think that women even in evangelical circles where women are not allowed uh, to preach, uh, let's say that Palin and McCain do win, and here you have this woman that could possibly be leading the free world, uh, and yet there's evangelicals voting for her that don't even believe that, that a woman should preach at the pulpit. Are, are, should, could this change the face of how evangelicals believe in the woman's role? I don't think it'll change the way evangelicals believe about women's roles. I think it's, it has sparked a discussion. And quite frankly, feminism has gained a foothold in many evangelical churches. Do you think and that's a good of, thing? No, I don't. Not at all. Why not? Uh, well, because we're about the gospel. The culture doesn't dictate truth. The gospel dictates truth. My job is not to be a political pundit or political activist. My job is to be a pastor and proclaim the truth of the gospel as clearly as I possibly can. And what? You see that? Now, y'all hear that? This is a younger bot. A lot body, uh, obviously, because Sarah Palin is running with uh, McCain, and this is 2008, y'all already know. Man. Yet when we were watching Larry, not Reed, uh, Larry Reed was a little boy, Larry King, and we saw the Smiley Preacher uh, on there and his wife, and, and Larry King was asking them questions about, will you attend a gay marriage? And... The wife jumped in there and said, yeah, we would. We have friends. Uh, and then he had to join his wife and say, oh, yeah, we do that. And the interview got worse after that. So much backlash happened in the Christian community that then at his local church, he said, no, we, 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 we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he, then he asked, and then he says, I do believe that he starts talking stuff after he get off the news. Then he wants to preach to tell the people the truth. Joel Osteen. Osteen. Then he goes back on the news and does the same thing. Marketplace preachers. This man didn't care who these people were. He stood his ground. When Balkan was challenged about this, he would not back down because he valued scripture more than acceptance or popularity in the culture. Possibly can. Well, wait a minute. What about the Old Testament and, and the prophet Deborah? I mean, she was a political leader. She was a wife. She was a mother. She was one of the, the biggest forces in, in the book of Judges. So that's the gospel right there. Uh, she, sure, she certainly was. And the fact that something happened doesn't mean that it's normative for the church. In Isaiah chapter 3, for example, one of the signs that a culture is under judgment is that women are in leadership in their nations. Wow. So Deborah was actually a sign that things were very bad in Israel, not a norm for the church. Margaret is wow. I'm telling y'all, he talked like the Sir Walter Jones show. How many times have I told you all that certain leaders are put in place by God's permissive will as a judgment? Hmm? Notice what he said. Just because something is, is happening doesn't mean that it's a good thing because the apostle, I'm sorry, uh, King Saul was not God's choice. But King Saul uh, was the people's choice and God allowed it because the people wanted it. And so God gave them Saul as a judgment. Like many of our presidents, says including 45. He was given to the people who voted for him as a judgment. <laughs> as judgment. So the women who keep defending Deborah being a, being a judge, you don't see the whole picture. This is why marketplace preaching got to stop because you don't understand that because somebody is in there, God allowed it to teach you a lesson. Now listen, listen the what she says here. Is it a little sexist or is it just me? <laughs> I would have to
to say the Reverend is, is sounding a little um, questionable there, but in the sense that I believe that everyone, um, despite gender, has an opportunity to serve, to give, and to play a role in making a difference in their communities, in their churches, and around the world. Reverend, this could be an exciting time. I mean, this could break through. We're becoming progressive in so many ways. We're seeing a black man possibly winning the presidency. We're seeing a woman here that's uh, on the Republican ticket that, that's, you know, rousing up uh, evangelicals of possibly to think twice about the woman's role in the church. I mean, this is fascinating times. They are fascinating times, and they're also frightening times. Yes. When you see Margaret Feinberg you use Ephesians chapter 5, uh, which clearly says that a husband is the head of the wife in order to justify somehow with this sleight of hand that Palin's husband is laying down his life by allowing her to do that. Number one, she's playing fast and loose with the text. Yes. And secondly, she is also ignoring the fact that Palin's responsibility as a wife and mother is governed by scripture, yep. not by whether we feel it's progressive in our culture. Margaret, final thought but, but, there. Bodie I believe that's a narrow interpretation and a boxy interpretation of the text, as well as the role of women, who in today's working families, many families in the United States need both the man and the wife in order to work outside of the home, in order to support the family, and to put that kind of burden on the family, whereby a woman must stay at home, um, I just don't think that translates into many working class families today. You know, my job is not to translate into working class families. My job is to be honest with the text. Right. And the text says in Titus chapter 2 and verse 5, a woman is to be the keeper of her home. Now, I will not violate the teaching of the text in order to somehow sound more appropriate for the culture. Mm. I am a herald of the truth of the gospel, and my job is to teach the gospel according to what the authors have said, not according to what I think the culture wants to hear. Mm. I think but Vodi, being a keeper of the home can be translated in so many different ways. And that means that if a woman happens to be the breadwinner, winner, shouldn't they have the opportunity to step out and take care of their family in that way? Listen. All right, what about the text that says the man and the woman should submit to one another? I think I'm just going <laughs> to leave it right there, folks. And I'm going to be studying the Bible tonight, and I promise to bring you two back. Balkum was never asked back to be on CNN again. <laughs> He wasn't coming back. The woman could, could run the house successfully, but notice the Proverbs 31 woman was doing things while she took care of the home. Do you understand? She was buying and selling, buying even land. She had workers working for her. She was a business-minded, entrepreneurial woman, and, the, and she still took care of the children and blessed her husband. Her husband was working in the gates. He might have been a civic leader, a politician. He could have been uh, something, all right? He, he worked a powerful job, and, and his, he's, on, he's on his job talking about how great his wife is. His, her, his, it, the scripture says that the husband loves her, deeply loves her. You understand? So when, 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 man, when a man say a woman should take care of home, that doesn't mean she needs to sit at home eating bonbons and washing dishes and barefoot and pregnant and uh, watching as the world turns. That's not it. Then she is a waste of time. <laughs> She's a waste to that man. She, what good is she just doing that? Uh, many my, um, women in my family, were they didn't, they didn't work a nine to five, but man, did they have business acumen. It just was amazing what these women did to help the man in his in his business. Uh, many of the men in my family uh, were were entrepreneurs, so they they got they they quit their jobs and they worked in the marketplace as carpenters, as as laymen, brick laymen, and cement masonmen, and all these things like that. And their wives helped them in that business. All right, uh, and so I'm with him on this, and that thing can still happen today. All right. That was good, Bob. That's good. That's good. Let's see what else. Yeah, I ended up, you know, some of you may have seen um, an interview that I did um, on CNN um, before the election, um, talking about, you know, some of these issues. I only got to do that one time. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that was pretty much it. The lady, the lady said after the, after the interview was over, that, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll have to have you back. Um, and I knew at that moment that I would never be back on that person's show again. Okay, I'm not going to play him uh, because he, the next guy is very questionable, John MacArthur, extremely questionable. You go to, to uh, um, my uh, Patreon uh, 
channel and you can see what we said about him out of his own mouth, how he praised um, a slavery. I, I, it's difficult for me to listen to John MacArthur. It's, it's very, very hard for me. See, y'all pray, pray my strength in the Lord. But, but Brother Bachman uh, was, was saying something important. Okay, because I'm going to play another interview with him. Uh, and you, I'll play that in a minute. I was talking about Donald Trump. Um, what was Yeah, I was talking about Barack Obama, um, Donald Trump, and, um, and Joe Biden. Okay, so let me ask you a question. Thank you, Kev Ward. Yeah, he's questionable. Let me ask you a question. Is sin, sin? Hmm? Is sin, sin? Hmm? Yes or no? All sin is sin. And we're not talking about the blaspheme of the Holy Ghost. You can't do that today. You can't do it. So it's sin, sin. Michael Moose says yes. Kelly says yes. Okay, all of y'all are saying yes. So, are you saying to me, are you telling me that God doesn't look at this sin, guy's sin, as a small sin and this guy's sin as a big sin? He sees all sins the same. You either going to get in or you ain't. Sin is sin, right? All unrighteousness is sin, Carlotta says. Carlotta. I'm sorry, I, you know, I always botch your name up. All right, y'all got that, right? So a couple of you got a little upset when I said that Donald Trump, Barack Obama, and Joe Biden is the same. By y'all's explanation, by y'all's answer, by y'all's definition of sin, those three men are the same. What you all did in the flesh is looked at Donald Trump and all the things that he did. And you looked at Barack Obama being a gentleman, right? Well, how many times have I told y'all that good men go to hell? Hmm? How many times have I told y'all that good men go to hell? So Barack Obama was a decent, good man, Jesus said he called no one good, but good in our analogy. He loved his wife. We, we never saw any hint of him cheating on his wife. He was, he was a good father, even though the, the kids went all crazy, but <laughs> good father, good statesman, a very mannerable man, you know, a, a Harvard Law graduate. Just He was just perfect, just a perfect guy. But... He killed babies. <laughs> he support killing babies, and he support this whole alphabet community thingy. You see what I'm saying? Donald Trump did a whole lot of crazy stuff. That's why he got all these lawsuits, and he's in court every day for all kind of stuff. His, his wife is pregnant, and he's laying in some porn star's bed. And trying to pay off, he and he, he's hot mics. He put tic tacs in his mouth, and he said he he basically sexually assaults women by grabbing their vajayjays. That guy got voted in as the president of the United States, and acted a darn fool for for four years. Uh, Joe Biden is considered a Catholic man, like Barack Obama. Seems to be very upscale man. But he killed babies too, and he pushes this this uh, this alphabet uh, community thing as well, among uh, uh, some of the other liberal things that they do. So I'm gonna ask you again: Are they or are they not the same men? Because if you was placed in the judgment seat in place of God, we would be most miserable. We'd be most, most miserable because you would you would look at you will compare two two sinners and say this guy committed a bigger sin so I'm gonna let I'm gonna let this person in uh, not let this person in but this one committed that little sin so I'm gonna let this one in that is not how God judges all unrighteousness is sin so Barack Obama 
uh, Clinton, I'm not Clinton, well, Clinton too, but you're talking about these current guys. Barack Obama, Donald Trump, and Joe Biden are in the same boat. What boat is that? Everybody who are proponents and voted for them and who say hurrah constantly ex explains that these men are God's men. Notice, white evangelicals have heralded Donald Trump as God's man. Black Pentecostals herald both Biden and Obama as God's man because they both were going to church. So the reason why I say they're all the same is because how y'all herald them as great godly men, but yet what they do and their policies does not represent holiness whatsoever. Hmm. Y'all don't like me today, don't you? I mean, I like y'all, but it seems like y'all don't want to like me today. And I would never say, in this case, I'm not going to tell y'all I don't care, because I do care. This time I care. So let me, let me, let me. Man, um, we thank you for a strength. Let me go to that show. Uh, let me see. So you want to offend nobody. <laughs> now that's a shame. It's the same thing I said with with uh, with uh, how institutes had their only worship, and then they would come over there with the saints and and, and mm -hmm. all this stuff. You can't. No, I, I disagree with that. Biden is the closest, best example so far in my lifetime. As of what? <laughs> okay, this was yesterday's show. Uh, another good example was President Obama, who knew this and did the best he could for all people that made a lot of black Americans angry, having wanting him to do more for specifically black and Christian people as he was himself. Barack Obama went to church just like, just like uh, Biden goes to church uh, because he's a Catholic. I sat with Barack Obama here in Chicago at Jeremiah Rice Church. When I was searching for a church home, I almost joined that church. And he was right up, he was right on the same aisle as me. He just was, he was our Senator Barack with a funny name. All right. He was faithful. He went to church. All right. But going sitting in a sanctuary means absolutely nothing. Nothing. The truth of the matter is when you get the power to be able to change lives, what do you do? You taint the very gospel in which you believe. Yes, when you decide you want to be a politician. You've got to tend to the people because you have joined uh, a club, the political club. And so you've got to um, bite your whatever you got and take care of the people and all. That, all right. So that's why it's difficult for Christians to be, be in uh, politicians because they must compromise the gospel when these policies are on the floor and then you may have to sign them or agree with them because you want to keep the votes all pointing at you. So you want to sit in that seat and much compromising happens when you are a Christian and you are in politics. So I cannot agree with you that Biden is the best where I, I have to say that I have to say this a done the way you said he was the best for you, <laughs> but I'm sorry to tell you Biden Barack Obama and Donald Trump are three of the same. Three of the same people. There's nothing different between the three of them as it pertains to holiness. They're the same beast as it pertains to holiness. I was specific when I said that yesterday and you all got upset. <laughs> they are the same beast. Same beast. Same beast. You get no green light. Yes. Because you entered into an agreement with the state or with your uh, with your employer employer. Because there's some people, some Christians who have to sell alcohol and they feel it is a sin for them to do that, but because they work for a, a grocery store, what have you, some of some Christians said, yeah, I can't do this. You gotta free me. And some bosses agreed that they would not allow this clerk to sell alcohol because of her Christian beliefs. I've seen that happen. It was a blessing. All right. Y'all can go to that show. 
Now we get back to Bartman. Body. Bodie. I'm going to say his name in different ways because, you know, pronouncing it can be very difficult. And that's a civil issue. If you ask me All about... Right. Now, he's getting ready to talk about Black Lives Matter, y'all. My color scheme is all off right now, so if y'all see all kind of colors and blue and purple and, <laughs> and green diamonds, and to try to ignore it, <laughs> okay? Black Lives Matter. This is an interview that Body did. Body. I, I know I call him Body, but it's <laughs> Bodie, <laughs> okay? <sighs> Buckle up. This is going to be quite exciting. When Balkum was interviewed by Emmy-nominated political analyst for CBS News, Rashad Ritchie, Balkum refused to give in to woke talking points and defended an extremely unpopular position concerning BLM. Let's start with the social justice movement. I believe that church should be a place that expresses and transforms policy because of its value system. What are your thoughts about the Black Lives Matter movement? Oh, wow, well, that's two very different things. The Black Lives Matter movement is very anti-church, it's very anti-Christian. It's a Marxist organization that was started explicitly as a Marxist organization that had openly anti-family and openly anti-Christian sentiments. Those sentiments had to be removed from their website because people found out about them. So if you're asking me about yes. faith and Black Lives Matter, I would say that the two are mutually exclusive, especially from a Christian perspective. Balkum's con yes, thank you, man. Remember I got in trouble after George Floyd was killed? We started hearing about Black Lives Matter. And then you all were fighting with me saying, no, we're not talking about that. Just the same. We're talking about the organization. And then I was like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not joining that mess. I'm not putting no placards on my door because the church was passing out placards and put Black Lives Matter on your door, put it in your window. I said, I'm not putting none of that stuff. I'm, and if, you, if you put it on my car, I'm going to burn it. No, I'm not going to do it. I am not joining. I'm not doing no, no rallies with you all. I'm not marching in the streets with none of y'all. No. Absolutely not. I will not also go into a room and say all lives matter when there's a whole bunch of black folks there. Now you sin it. That's not me. Why? You don't have to. Let those people rally. Let them have their, their, their little time. But to go in there and, and purposely try and stir up trouble, that's a sin. That is like going into a crowded theater and, and screaming uh, a fire. So when I so when I when these people walk up in there like a Candace Owens and say now all lives matter in 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 a room of all these black people yeah they they should have uh, <laughs> they should have screamed you out of that room all right no I, I that's when you that's too much of drawing a line there no we know that all lives matter you understand so. Let them people have their moments, but I'm not going to join in. Because what you're doing is you're provoking anger in those people when you do that. And the scriptures speak expressly against that, that you could call someone to sin. And if you do something and it offends someone, the scripture says God's going to hold you responsible for pressing that button. I know that seems unfair. I didn't write it. I'm just a messenger. That's right, Kelly. You're causing division and you're sowing discord. All right, so you don't need to walk into a, a black room, all black room, say, all lives matter. Don't walk in the room. Just be quiet. There's some things you ain't got to say. Some of y'all got beat up because you thought you could say something. I know we have freedom in America, but your freedom is going to get your behind beat up. <laughs> all right? So, no, Black Lives Matter, please. And he said they removed that stuff off the website because they were busted. I wonder why. Continued refusal to give in to Richie's pressure made Richie more and more agitated throughout the interview. And I mean, he's just doing everything that he can and he's not getting what he wants. And so at the end, he's like, you know, we just got a, a, a few more seconds left. And, and he says, well, I, I just, I just want to ask you, because he's gone every angle that he could go, right, to try to get whatever it is that he's trying to get and prove that I'm the wrong kind of black man, I guess. There are some definite positives that Black Lives Matter 
uh, they've been able to work and negotiate with various governments around the country. You mean in order to enrich I, themselves personally? Well, let's go ahead and get into it, brother, <laughs> since you posed the question. Um, in Minneapolis, it was actually Black Lives Matter, the organization, who brought the attention to the murder of uh, George Floyd. Uh, they Actually, not it was only the brought, video that did that. Well, right. sir, they, remember. They didn't do that, the video uh, did that. There was yeah, no need for them to do yeah. that. This is really upsetting me greatly. How could you, man, be so intelligent? You, they said you won a, a what kind of award was that from CBS, CNN, or whatever. How could you be so liberal left like that to, to your reasoning don't make no sense? Uh, Bachman is right, Bachman. <laughs> I call him Bachman. Bachman. I'm telling you, I'm going to mess his name up a few times. The video told us what happened. We saw the man put his knee on the man and he couldn't breathe. The video, we didn't need no black organization to tell us what the, we saw with our own two eyes. Some people needed Black Lives Matter because they needed an opportunity to act a darn fool. Because the video was. If Jesus was here, do you think he would say black lives matter? Well, if Jesus was here, he would say lives matter. I know, for example, if Jesus was here, he would say that the black lives that are being obliterated in the womb matter. And as a Christian, I believe that lives matter from the moment of conception all the way to their moment of natural death. Okay. And so I'm absolutely committed to lives mattering. But I will not be held captive by an organization that has used that terminology in order to back people into a corner yep. and cause them to live with this cognitive dissonance between the organization that again is antithetical to biblical Christianity okay. and the idea that people regardless of who they are and where they come from matter. I'm a Christian, I believe people are made in the image of God and have inherent dignity, worth and value. My question. So wow, did y'all hear that? <sighs> Bacham ain't no joke. The old Bauckham and the new and the new Bauckham. Ain't no joke. He gon' Richard gonna bring up Jesus. If Jesus was on earth, would he say Black Lives Matter? Heck you no. Know. Why would he why would he say that? Huh? Why would he say that? Huh? Jesus died for everybody, the whole world. And the uh God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. For black people? This is why you all voted for Donald for for Barack Obama, thinking that he was going to be the next Black Hope or the Black Hope. Couldn't have we didn't have one. Oh man, Billy Joe is in concert right now. What? Billy Joe's in concert? I'm at to stop this show. Billy Joe is my dude. Um, y'all thought that he was going to be put in the presidency to help Black people. The job of the president, come close. This is why I say that Trump, Barack Obama, and Joe Biden are the same. Why? The job of the executive branch, who's ever sitting in that seat at the White House, supposed to serve and protect all people. Do you understand? I'm not talking about the police. But they're supposed to do that and uphold the Constitution of the United States for all people. And if you're trying to, if you're voting for somebody because of a certain color, you are wasting your time because once that certain color get in office, like Barack Obama did, he realized that he can't be black. He realized that he had to be a neutral color. You all didn't realize that, so you put him in office. And then he couldn't do much for you. As a matter of fact, Mitch McConnell says, our job is to make sure that this man do not serve another term. The man who was the uh, majority in, in Congress said, do y'all remember that? He said, my job, my whole job, my whole job, not my job is to serve the people and my constituents and, and the people of America, of the people, by the people, for the people. No, my job and everybody who's behind me is to make sure that this black man don't get another term. Do y'all remember that? 
And Barack Obama realized what color he was that day. <laughs> All right. My second question to you is, do you remember the parable of the sheep? Yes. You're a theologian. Yes. No, Richie, don't do this, man. Richie, don't do it. Every time a news pundit bring up a Bible story to a professional like Vadi Bakum, they getting ready to get, get eatedith upeth. <laughs> Richie, throw in the white towels, a flag or something, because he getting ready to eat you up. <laughs> All right, let's go. There's an imp my question. So my second question to you is, do you remember the parable of the sheep? Yes. You're a theologian. Yes. There's an emphasis that needs to be placed on making sure we have economic equity, making sure that we have social access, making sure that we have reforms in policing and criminal justice, because those are the biases that we've been living under. So that would be the sheep in the ditch, brother, and the shepherd would pay attention to that one as the parable says when Jesus spoke it. You don't agree with that? Not at all, because you completely misused that text. The <laughs> Dang, dang, dang. <laughs> you completely botched it up. <coughs> you know, sinners or something else. <coughs> they will say, God knows my heart. Come here, let me tell you about your heart. <laughs> Can y'all tell me what God said about your heart? Sinners love to botch this stuff up. Don't judge me. Did you keep did you keep reading? The Bible says, don't judge me. Okay. Did you keep reading? No. Then shut up. <laughs> Leave the interpretive dance of the scriptures up to us. Okay. All well, right. one of three. Pay Let's attention to that one as the parable says when Jesus spoke it. You don't agree with that? Not at all, because you completely misused that text. The parable is one of three parables that were told together. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. The emphasis there is on the fact that the Pharisees did not celebrate when individuals came to faith in Christ. So you absolutely obliterated the meaning of that text. <laughs> how, how did I misuse the text? You misused the text because you allegorized the text in order to pour your meaning into it when Jesus very clearly used that text in order to say something very specific. You don't get to change what he what meant by that. Do you think the social movement of Black Lives Matter is a bad thing? Or do you yeah. think it's a good thing? No, I think it's I think it's a bad thing. I think Tell it's me dividing, why. number one, I think it's dividing people. Let me go back to what you said but earlier. It, but people you are already divided, brother. Can I can I again are, are, are we gonna be equitable since you're about equity? Can we be equitable in the way that we communicate with one another? I got I got one so, minute, man. Oh my God. <laughs> I know too many of your old pastors who cannot stand toe to toe with somebody like Richie, who would be like, you're right, you're right. If this was Joel Osteen sitting there, he would be like, yeah, you're right. Well, I don't know. Well, possibly. Listen, I, I don't, I, I'm not God. I can't, I can't. No, Negro, you botched that thing up. Let me tell you the proper interpretation. You obliviated that text. So let's talk about equity, 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 <laughs> equity, inclusion, and that other thing. <laughs> I love it. Go ahead. Go ahead, Doc. So what I'm saying is, by the way, I love this. <laughs> yeah, it's good. What I'm saying is that if you go to those cities that you mentioned, yes, BLM got involved in Minneapolis and Atlanta, and the crime rate skyrocketed specifically because of the things that they got involved in. Wow. All right, that's you not have true. what's called this Ferguson effect. It's absolutely true. Anybody can go and look at the, at the, at the crime records Dr. before Vogue? BLM got involved and after. Okay, all right. The interview ended with. Wow. The man came there and did his homework. The Ferguson uh, effect is absolutely correct. The same thing happened in Chicago, where I live, and in Baltimore. I'm trying to tell y'all, crime went shh. <laughs> Black Lives Matter. Why weren't y'all taking this, ripping and running in the streets? and burning McDonald's and Burger King and Wendy's down 
Why couldn't y'all come together and start training and teaching and rearing up our young our children at Black Life? Them white folks, them white companies got so nervous they was uh, taking down certain, uh, they were changing certain food items. Aunt Jemima became Mrs. Jemima. <laughs> Uncle Ben became <laughs> Dr. Benjamin. <laughs> <coughs> They was taking books out of the libraries and they were change, changing a TV theme and they were changing uh, song lyrics. Oh, they were scared. <laughs> it was so crazy to me. They were scared. And black folk was like, see, look what we did. We came together and we had uh, these corporations to change this, change that. And crime went, Shoop! the Ferguson effect. <laughs> All right. an, let's go, go back. Go and look at the, at the, at the crime records Dr. before <laughs> BLM got involved and after. Okay. All right. The interview ended with Richie making an absolute fool of himself. And he says, well, do you tell white evangelicals that they need to get rid of pictures of white Jesus? And you could tell when he asked that he was like, I got you now. Do you tell the white evangelicals you preach to they need to get rid of that picture of white Jesus? To which I responded, I, I tell everybody to get rid of pictures of Jesus. Uh, I tell them they get, need to get rid of pictures of Jesus, period, because well, it's a violation of the Second of Commandment. Right. When I think Jesus a is okay. A picture of Jesus is a violation of the Second brother. Commandment. So I, I, I don't want to see any pictures of Jesus because it's a violation of the Second Commandment. And, 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 and so he missed it and he said, no, no, no. But, yeah, but do you tell those white evangelicals, right? Because, uh, again, like, like it was a curse word, you know, you preach to white evangelicals, right? You, I hurt my feelings, by the way. But do you tell them to get rid of pictures of white Jesus? It's but do you image. tell them to get rid of their it's white Jesus? And so because he didn't understand me the first time, I said, well, actually, pictures of Jesus are a violation of the second commandment. So I tell everybody to get rid of pictures of Jesus because I don't want people violating the second commandment. It's a graven image. They need to get rid of it. They shouldn't be pictures of Jesus. Doc, I got to bring you back on. <laughs> I got to bring you back on. And guess what? He never came back on. <laughs> he, ne he never came back on. Y'all, that thing right there, that thing right there messed me up. Messed me up. My brother Justin uh, sent that to me. Hilarious, y'all. Hilarious. All right, so these marketplace preachers, um, y'all really need to, need to do something about that. All right, I got a question here about Kojic. Is Somebody asked a question. It, it, it was... Uh, about Kojic and their policies and the things that they were doing in her local church. And she asked, do you believe that Kojic uh, church is a cult? Uh, no, uh, the Kojic is not a uh, cult. What I believe, though, is many of the local um, bodies are cultish. I mean, because, you know, you have to understand is it's it, they're bragging about six million people. But I know that that number is probably half. All right. So let's assume the three million people. That's a lot of churches. And many of those churches are manipulative. They they uh, they bully you from the pulpit, witchcraft, all kind of stuff. Ask me how I know I come up under that kind of ministries. All right, and they kind of call themselves fire and brimstone preachers, but but they were they were like um, Jezebelian uh, and and cultish. So the church at large, I wouldn't say is a cult. No, and your experience might be cultish at your local church. Um, so I don't throw out wide nets uh, because there's a lot of churches in the Church of God in Christ. Um, can you tell me tell me how close the truth is? Okay, uh, this is Rose Rose Allen sent a video. I think uh, did I watch it? I don't even know. Uh, can you tell the Can you tell me how close the truth is? This explanation of sin iniquity and transgressions. I never un understood the difference. So I thought that sin was more important. Um, <clears throat> I'm glad you said that at that second part, because sin is not more important. Again, all unrighteousness is sin. Iniquity is sin. Transgression is sin, but they are, they are two different types of sins. All right. So the, the sin is doing something that is against God. All right. That is an ungodly act that you did. That's sin. No matter what you're doing, that's what it is. But then there are different types of sin that you can commit. And one is transgression. 
transgression is typically something you do against someone else, whether you did it on purpose or whether you or whether you didn't do it or you did, did it by mistake. There's sometimes when a person, as they say, he fell into sin, okay, or he fell into a transgression. Some people will do that not knowing that they are sinning. That's why the, the, the phrase fall into sin came up because the person is doing something and they just fall. All right, so you can't fall into sin if you're doing it on purpose, but some people are sinning and they don't even know it, so they fell into sin. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Transgression is going against something, or, or transgressing or trespassing against someone, and that is a sin. But iniquity, I think, is the worst of the of the of the two, because even though the scripture says sin, iniquity, and transgressions, iniquity and transgression are sins. You understand? So iniquity is likened to transgression, but unfortunately, the person who has iniquity in their heart. They premeditate, typically it's a premeditated sin that they want to do. They wake up to sin and um, they planned it out uh, and they, they do it. And in many cases, it is without remorse. So it's because that is like a, that is a sin sickness that's in their hearts. That's what iniquity is. I hope that, I hope that makes some, some, some sense. Okay, there you go, Kelly. Do not fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. All right, that's a great question, by the way. Um, let's see. Any, okay, I, I saw another question that popped up. Uh, T D T T. Now I'm gonna read this right quick. I wasn't gonna read it because some of these some of these are private. Uh, but I wanted to read this because this actually encouraged me, and this is this is actually a confirmation. And I'm gonna drop the movie, you all. The movie night is tonight. I'll drop it in one second here. All right. Uh, after I read this, this is really great. Uh, in the Sunday school lesson, God tells Nathan to go tell David these words. Uh, this is what the Lord of Heaven Armies has declared. I took you from tending sheep in the pasture and selected you to be the leader of my people, Israel. I have uh, been with you wherever you have gone and I have destroyed all your enemies before your eyes. Now I will make your name as famous as anyone who has ever lived on the earth. All right. This is, this is the beginning of this person's uh, email towards me. I didn't know where they were going, but as I kept reading, uh, I was encouraged because again, this is confirmation uh, so, Walter, I do not know whether this is uh, from God or, or my heart, but I'm going to speak this in just in case. And uh, this actually was from your heart, but it was God putting it in your heart. <laughs> you understand? You see what I did? In order for David's name to be great, he suffered trouble. Some caused by his own doings, that's me, y'all, but the majority due to his enemies. I've had those. David had afflictions, but the Lord delivered him out of them all. Now, what I'm going to say next is going to seem insensitive, but you read through it, you will understand if you read through it. I do delight in seeing that trouble has come your way. Remember, I said, read through it, <laughs> and I got it. <laughs> I get to witness a true son being cleansed and strengthened by the Holy Spirit and the prayers of the saints. I get to witness a true son not making any justif uh, justifications or excuses about what is being laid out. I get to witness your attitude of humility to know that this battle is bigger than you. I could go on, but I think you get what I'm saying. If trouble hadn't come your way, I could say before God that his sons have no strength to stand or last or fight. You're a good fighter, Walter, and I have um, thoroughly enjoyed seeing this fight. I enjoy seeing you not willing to give up or give in to the lies and the slanders. This encouraged me. I Again, I was going to share, save this for myself, and I asked God, can I? I, I need permission, and the Lord says yes. <laughs> I'm sharing it with you all because this applies to some of you. You've gone through a lot of struggles and, and fights, in battles and some of the things were self-inflicted that you did to yourself. Others were from enemies, like she said here. But the Lord took you out of a lot of that stuff and you're strong today because of it. This is confirmation, not just for me, but it's also for some of you who are wondering why me, why me? Well, my answer to you is 
Why not you? Hmm. Can y'all put that in the comment section? Why not you? I still have to say I'm honored to support your schooling and, and subscribe. Our paths may not ever bring, bring us live, live before each other, but know that the pleasure has been on mine. It's, it's a wonderful, beautiful email that I, I had to read because it blessed me today. It really, really, truly blessed me today. And again, it was confirmation. I said the other day that I'm, I'm so proud of David because I, I'm like him. Y'all might have not have heard me say that. Maybe you don't remember. But I said, David is my dude because that's me. David did all that sinning. And that boy died and God says, that guy is the apple of my eye. Ain't that? He's a man after my own heart. But, but he did all that sinning. God has taken his transgressions and his iniquities and his sins and pardoned them made him a powerful king to the point where he called, God calls his son Jesus, David. <laughs> he didn't call his son Jesus Solomon or Saul or Moses or Joshua. No, he called his son David. <laughs> Y'all, I'm telling you, that blessed me. That blessed me, blessed me, blessed me. Uh, let's see. T.D. Jake said that you don't have to give your tithe is, is, it's not theologically correct. T.D. Jakes is correct. I never thought I'd say that, but T.D. Jakes is correct. But why would you not want to? But why, 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 why would you want to? <laughs> I couldn't believe it. He, he did say that Abraham gave a tithe of all to Melchizedek. He did. Jakes was correct. Um, believe it or not, Jake's was correct. It's not for this dispensation, and it's not if you're not giving food. The church don't need food. <laughs> the church need money. <laughs> Tithing is food, all right. Uh, and so we talked about that at the beginning of the show. Um, and indeed, Abe. It wasn't Abraham. It was, it was brother Abe gave uh, a a tenth part of the spoil of wars to Mel to um, Melchizedek. Melchizedek, but then he gave the 90% away to pagan kings like the king of Sodom. He didn't keep none of it. So you can't tithe today by Abe's standards, nor can you tithe by this, the law standards. It's impossible to tithe by the Bible standards today. It's utterly impossible to tithe today. You cannot tithe today by no standards of the scriptures. You can't. Why? Ain't no temple. Number two, ain't no Levites. Number three, ain't no priests. Hmm? Number four, it was never money. All right? Now, that part, you can bring food in and say it's a tithe. No. No, you just, you just bring in pounds to the first family. That's what we did back in the day. Pounds. <laughs> pounds. Uh, but can't that same grace, restoration, and pro promotion happen with uh, Ob Obama, Biden, and Clinton if they repent and change their position? Absolutely. Uh, yes, they sure can. The grace of a great, great comment there. Uh, I get text as well, you all. Uh, the grace of God can abound in Clinton, Barack Obama, and in uh, Trump. No one ever said that a person is doomed to death and never give them an opportunity to repent. No one ever said that. But what I said was, and I'm standing on it, those three men are in the same bracket, sinners. Same bracket. Willful sinners which is iniquity. They're willfully doing it. So until they repent for this, I don't know what, I don't know what else to tell y'all. This next question. Good evening, brother. 
praying all this way with you. I have a question on salvation. In the Old Testament, were they justified by faith or their works? That's a good question. Um, can y'all tell me how was Abraham saved? Hmm? Can somebody tell me? I've had a trying week. Uh, uh, this last letter encouraged me as well. Yes, I was done wrong and blindsided in a way. Persecution. Revenge was my first thought on my husband's lips, but then God quickly said, vengeance is mine. So I started, uh, let, me, let me find it. It went away. So I started praying for the company and I suddenly felt a burden lifted. Let God fight your battles always. I'm now resting in the Lord and Jesus. I have the victory and freedom in him. That's Carolyn Lee. Carolyn, thank you. That's beautiful. Love that. See why I read that letter? See why God says I have a permission to read it? Um, yes, Abraham was saved by faith. You all are saying. By faith. God credited him because he had faith. So it carried all the way into Paul's letter to the Romans. Let's see if we can find it. Let's go to Romans chapter 4. So she asked, he or she, I don't know who this is. It's a telephone. Um, uh, I have a question on salvation. In the Old Testament, were they justified by faith or works? Nope. Faith. That's why the hall of faiths, who's in that hall? It wasn't a hall of works. It's called a hall of faith. <laughs> Y'all get it? Um, all right, what what Dion doing? Is Dion acting up? What Dion? Dion, are you acting up, man? Hmm, 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 hmm. Are you putting stuff in my mouth, Dion? Huh? You putting words in my mouth? I like to know. Hmm, hmm. I like to know. Uh, it's Johanna, can y'all tell me where the Hall of Faith is? So here is Romans chapter 4. Look what he says. It starts off by saying, the what of Abraham? <laughs> y'all see that, right? The faith of Abraham. Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation, what did he discover about being made right with God? If his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about. But that was not God's way. For the scripture tells us Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of what? His faith. There's your answer, my dear brother or sister, whoever this is. So, and we're talking to Abraham, which is Old Testament. So you are justified by faith all the way from back then until now. <laughs> Dion acting up. <laughs> Dion. <laughs> all right, we're praying for you, Darlene. Uh, Y'all pray for Darlene Anderson. She's not feeling well. She's about to turn in. Um... So as he did that, then we go to Romans 5, and what does it say? Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That was another good question. All right. Okay, I, I think I took care of the last one. All right, you all, we made a grave error. Uh, Bernie tricked us uh, because Bernie made us believe that it was his birthday yesterday. It was not. <laughs> he sent me a text. He said, no, no, no. <laughs> no, it was his wife's birthday. They are so close. They love each other so much that they confuse each other's birthdays. <laughs> we did all that singing we 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 blew the horn, y'all. <laughs> we blew the horn. 
We applauded. We jumped up and down. We, we painted our, our faces white. We did some mimes. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have. Hold on. I mean, we went, we went, we went bunkers for you. We, we we went bunkers for you, and it wasn't even your birthday. What a waste of time! I mean, I call in all my mind friends, <laughs> and man, we <laughs> where my where my music at? Hold on. Hello. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for my music, y'all. Hello? No. No, that's not it. No. 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 Uh-uh. No. <laughs> no. That one. There's a rope. There's a wall. I'm stuck in a fucking Okay, okay, wait. Stop. Stop. Hammer time. <laughs> Hammer time. Stop. Hammer time. Oh, man. Something wrong with me, y'all. I chopped that broccoli, boy. I chopped <laughs> we did all, all that for Bernie, and it wasn't even his birthday. What a way. <laughs> Wait, hold on. Let me see. Do I have anything about that? Let me <laughs> what a waste. So we got to do it again. It wasn't a waste. It was, his, it was his wife's birthday. So happy birthday, Terry. We love you, girl. We appreciate you. <laughs> Renee's telling me to go to bed. Oh, let me drop this movie. Uh, what's the name of this movie? It's called Popular and Memorable. It is a series uh, that we're doing in the movie room. Y'all let me know if it drop on your head. <laughs> Watch out, Rogers. It may, it may drop on your head. This is an episode from the Power of Film series. So today we're going to focus on popular and memorable moments in film. It's a wonderful narration, and y'all check it out. It's only about 40 minutes long, um, but it's pretty good, and then you're going to see a lot of your favorites in that. All right? And uh, you can go from there. <clears throat> God, thank you for your presence and your blood and your love and all the people who were here on meeting me on a, a Sunday night and those who are watching the replay. I bless them in the, in the field. I bless them when they come. I bless them when they go. We cast out every stronghold. Sickness and poverty must cease for the devil is defeated. We are blessed. God, thank you for them. They have got the word in their hearts so that they might not sin against you. So help them, God. Continue to bring them through this week, safely through another week, that we might be able to meet again and fellowship in the bunker room. We thank you, God. We bless you forever. We'll give your name the praise in Jesus' name. Thank God. Amen. All right, y'all, it's time for me to go and uh, take this suit off and um, go upstairs and play with my grandbabies before they go to sleep because baby girl don't play. She be putting them babies to sleep like clockwork. <laughs> All right, let's go to Patreon. Go ahead and watch the movie. Tomorrow I'll be posting more stuff on Patreon and throughout the week to help you all get through your day. Morning Manor will be kicking off at around 9 o'clock Central Standard Time, 10, 10 o'clock in the p.m., and let's see what we got for you tomorrow morning. It's a goodie. It's a goodie. It's a goodie. Thank you all for supporting the Cash App there, So Walter J. Thank you all for supporting uh, me on um, PayPal and the P.O. Box and all other ways you've been given. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It has been able to allow me to do whatever I do.
because it's expensive to run this this empire. It's expensive. <laughs> All right. Okay. I'm going to wake up and eat some breakfast and go ride my new bicycle. 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 <laughs> I'm going to go up and down uh, the neighborhood and, and enjoy the wind because it's been, it was like 80 degrees today. At least it felt like that. And we're going to be in the high 60s this week. And so I'm taking that bike on, out, out on the road. It's a blessing. Take care of yourselves and one another. I love y'all. Ain't nothing you can do about it. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you for the super chat. And anybody else who might have given, thank y'all. All All right. See you in Patreon. And I'll see you tomorrow morning. Take care. I love y'all. Does it seem like you can't get a good woman? Ladies, wonder why you can't keep a man? Then read The Four Women That Men Desire, Volume 1, by Sir Walter Jones to figure out how to break the cycle. Go to Amazon.com to get your copy today. It's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are?